Okay, I'm going to give you a, um, a, uh, a real biologically focused discussion on what happens in the wet lab when we take all of this high volume data, we give it to the statistical team, which is Brian, oh, the paparazzi there got me, <laughs> Brian and Elias and uh, a whole team of other statisticians that we work with. We bring their predictions back to the lab and then we've got to rally the biological team at the bench and test those validation. Um, and I'm going to show you some of our success and I'll mention some of our failures as well. Uh, there's more text in the outline slide right here than I have in any other slide. So I'm a very visual person. I show lots of pictures. So if you don't understand the picture, there aren't going to be any words to help you. So raise your hand or throw something at me uh, to get my attention so that I can describe it because there won't be words to help you. But I'm going to go through the mouse model that we use to identify genes that we believe confer susceptibility to type 2 diabetes. Uh, and then this is published. All of this data that I'm going to describe here is unpublished. We're very excited to show this data to you, how we use modules to identify genes, and then how we use causal inference to predict drivers at these modules and test them. And I'm going to uh, end with a discussion of NFATC2 which we believe is a critical driver in the islet. And I'll give some discussion, if I have time, for how we've used modules to identify key loci, loci that drive proliferation in beta cells, which is in the diabetes field, that's sort of the holy grail that we're all working toward. So we, we've seen this many times. Um, uh, we know that we're in an epidemic of uh, diabetes in the United States and other westernized societies. There's a close relationship between obesity and uh, confirmed type uh, diabetes patients. These are 2009 numbers from the CDC. And what you can see here is there are regional differences in obesity with some regions of the country of upwards of 30% of adults are considered obese with a BMI greater than 30. And that goes hand in hand with upwards of a little over 10% having uh, diagnosed diabetes. And that's diagnosed. So you can imagine the undiagnosed are even higher than that. Uh, we see this in the news all the time. Local governments are uh, outlawing um, super big gulps in an attempt to control this epidemic. We think that this is largely environmental. It's inactivity its diet, uh, whereas this is genetic. Clearly there's a relationship between obesity and diabetes, and we believe that the environmental factors that contribute to obesity unmask the genetic susceptibility that confers diabetes. We model this dichotomy in these two mouse strains. So for example, over here, we're looking at black six mice. They're the canonical mouse strain that virtually everybody in the world uses in their lab. And over here are BTBR mice. We can make both mice equally obese by deleting leptin, which is a hormone that controls their appetite. So leptin deficient mice spend their entire day eating. We can make black six, black six mice obese, BTBR mice obese, but the black six mouse, despite morbid obesity, never becomes diabetic. Whereas the BTBR mouse always becomes diabetic. So with these two mouse strains, we've now separated obesity from diabetes. And we think of the BTBR as a animal that is genetically predisposed to develop diabetes in response to obesity. And we've spent 10 years exploiting this genetic difference to identify key genes that confer that susceptibility. And there's two ways to think about it. You can say, well, what is it the BTBR mouse does but shouldn't do, right, that gives rise to diabetes? Or more interesting, what does the B6 mouse do to allow it to avoid diabetes that the BTBR mouse fails to do? And down here I'm showing you plasma glucose uh, plotted here on this axis. Uh, all of these animals in this part of the curve are the black six mice. This animal right here is the BTBR that at 10 weeks of age, when obese, develops severe hyperglycemia. 
Now, I want to point out this mouse right here, which is the four-week BTBR animal, and we spent a lot of time characterizing that animal. It doesn't have a phenotype, it's not hyperglycemic, but we know that it's fated to become hyperglycemic six weeks later. So we actually phenotype this animal that doesn't have a phenotype. It has a fate. And we're spending a lot of time looking for biomarkers in that animal that portend diabetes one month later. This is a network that um, basically indicates we view this as a systems biology project. And yesterday, all of the lines, uh, where's Steve? That were connecting the various tissues were of the same thickness. And then Steve showed a weighted network versus an unweighted network, and he said weighted networks were better. So I changed the thickness of some of the lines to make the weighted network between the tissues. And we actually think that most certainly it's wrong, but, and it probably reflects my bias, that there's a, a connection, a strong connection between the pancreas, where the islets are, and the intestine, because there's a hormone that is secreted from the intestine that affects pancreatic function. So I don't mean to imply that the brain doesn't do anything to the adipose. What I simply mean to imply here that this is sort of my biased view of this system's uh, process between these tissues. Taking a systems approach, we isolated multiple tissues from our mouse, brain, islet, liver, adipose tissue, two different muscles, as a function of three variables, their obesity, whether they were black six or BTBR, so strain, or age. And these were very strong contrast conditions in this study. And I'll mention that this is published several years ago. We have a public website that allows you to put in any gene of your interest and immediately pull up the modules that were calculated in those tissues, their correlation structure within that tissue as well as between tissues. And basically what you can see here is these are the modules that we learned, and this is a slightly different way of looking at it. These are the heat maps, looking at the expression of the genes. So along uh, the top here would be the animals. These are the genes, and these colored bricks are the modules. And when you see this sort of vertical pattern here, it shows the coordinate nature of the expression of the genes. I want to move on now to the more recent data for which we haven't published, and that's to repeat that study, but not as a function of age, strain, and obesity in our mice, but just as a function of strain, so a genetic screen. And what we did is we made a whole panel of what are called F2 mice. And, and these mice derive from uh, breeding the B6 and the BTBR to make a population of what we call F1s, or the first generation. And then when you breed the F1s, you make the F2s. And the value of the F2s is that they segregate from the most severely diseased animals, as if they got all of the bad alleles from the BTBR mouse, to the most supremely protected, sort of bulletproof. They got all of the good alleles from the B6. And undoubtedly, there's good alleles in the BTBR that they also got. So the point is, is to take these genetic differences in these two mouse strains and randomize them together in this large population of F2 mice. And they're shown over here. And importantly, they were all obese, and they were all sacrificed at 10 weeks of age. So in this genetic study, the only contrast variable that we attempt to focus on are genetic differences in the F2. And then we profiled six tissues in about 500 of these mice. And after recovering from the avalanche of data, which that took us about a year, um, we calculated modules and performed the causal inference that I'm going to show to you now. To make the point that in the diabetes field, there's a great deal of attention being focused on the islets. It's the only cell type in your body that makes and secretes insulin. And if you lose islets, you're in trouble. In type 1 diabetes, your immune system attacks your islets and they die. In type 2 diabetes, they die because you become hyperglycemic and there's glucotoxicity that kills them. So if you lose these cells, you have no choice but to take insulin through a syringe. And so there's a great deal of interest in trying to protect these cells from dying 
or better, promote them to grow. And if we could do that, we would have a better alternative to the treatment of diabetes. These are, these are islets from one F2 animal that happen to have very high glucose and low insulin. Whereas these islets are from a different F2. In fact, this was a cage mate of this animal as judged by its number. It has lower glucose and much higher insulin. And you can just see that these are, they're bigger, they're juicier, they just look better. When they're pale like this, they have much lower amount of insulin in them. And so somebody should say, well, mouse, we all know that working with mice, it's very noisy. These are islets from single mice. How do you know that that's really meaningful? And so we, we isolated islets from 500 mice and calculated modules. So here again now I'm showing modules. So these are the genes. There's 500 mice, and you can see the, the red and green stripes. And Peter's going to raise his hand and he says, wait a minute, those are, those are not signed. Those are unsigned modules. And yes, they are. <laughs> uh, otherwise, you would see the, the scruffy nuts that he said was features of the signed modules. So that, that doesn't affect the point that I'm going to make here. We recalculated the signed modules, and I'll show you that in a moment. But what I do want to highlight is that there's a, a module right here that I explode over here that is super enriched with cell cycle genes. I, I forget the Bonferroni p-value is like 10 to the minus 100. So we just call this our cell cycle module or CC module. And we've been on the track for this thing for about eight years now. Because now we have this thing in our genetic study. And I'll show you in a moment that it maps as EQTL. I'll explain what that is. But this is very important to us. And I want to show you that an animal that has sort of red expression of these genes is better off than an animal that has a green expression. So green is a decrease, and red is an increase in expression. And if I simply sort the mice based on their expression of just these 200 genes, which are cell cycle in nature, and just the islets, you can see that they give rise to animals that are more protected against diabetes versus those that are not. That's very important to us. And we think that's very diagnostic for at least one contributing factor. I'm not claiming that cell cycle regulation in the islets of these mice is the only contributing factor for diabetes, but we think it's one of the more important ones. So this is one use of the modules that has been very helpful to us to go from 3,000 microarrays in six tissues and use it as a dimension reduction in complexity. Because now we can talk about the CC module. And we know exactly what that means. It's the behavior of this genes. And we think that it's um, a very important contributor for why these mice become diabetic. I was telling Steve um, at lunch yesterday, this figure um, comes with a lot of pride as well a little bit of embarrassment because it summarizes the about six years of work. And um, what we're looking at here is the EQTL, which were identified in these six tissues. And each colored dot here is a gene, or actually the expression of a gene. Okay, so the y-axis of these panels is the genomic location of the gene. Sorry, this is the ge genomic location of the gene. This is where the gene maps, okay? And so there are these cis traits indicated in black, meaning that those are genes that map to themselves. And you can think of some sort of polymorphism in the DNA that is a directly affecting the expression of that gene. Where, whereas these vertical colored bands, for example, run, one right here, are genes that are located throughout the genome but map to a discrete spot. And we call those hot spots. And Brian's going to defend that term. And in fact, I have the luxury of of, of saying all of this without defending it because Brian and the Elias are going to uh, provide that mathematical justification tomorrow. But we think of this as the genetic architecture of gene expression 
in these tissues that we profiled. And over here, we have the architecture of all of these clinical traits that we measured. And I'm highlighting a couple here, so beta cell proliferation. We had a direct measure of beta cell proliferation in every single mouse. And we can treat that as a quantitative trait. And we can map that. And you can, if you go over here, you can see that, well, it maps to this local sign chromosome 17. And of course, what Brian and Elias have done is allow us to ask this question of, well, who causes who? For these genes that map to a locus, do they affect the trait, or do the trait affect the gene expression, or are they independent? And of course, we get very interested when we see a collection of traits, like here on 17. There's a whole host of traits of beta cell proliferation and others like cholesterol that map, that co-map with EQTL all on chromosome 17. So there's a relationship between the expression of these genes in these key tissues and these clinical traits in terms of both show the same genetic dependence at these particular discrete loci. We can see the same thing for other traits. So we have a collection here and here that co-map to these EQTL hotspots. And what I'm gonna focus on actually is a collection of traits mapping to chromosome two, including insulin, that co-map with this EQTL hotspot in the islet. Before I do that, I'm just gonna I blow up the, the architectural plots for the first three tissue, tissues here, and you can really see uh, a lot of fine detail here. So again, when, when we see the, this kind of behavior, what it indicates is that there are genes essentially scattered throughout the genome, all of which are showing this genetic dependence for their expression pattern. And this particular hotspot at the end of chromosome six is not only unique to the islet, it's our hottest hotspot. So we tend to get excited about that because it's tissue specific and it's really hot. There are several thousand genes that map to this locus on chromosome six with LOD scores of about 150. And a LOD score of 150 is equivalent to a p-value of 10 to the minus 150. So we're absolutely certain that there's some genetic factor that is mediating this kind of behavior. So this guy is absolutely tissue specific. And you can kind of see throughout examples of hotspots that are in common between tissues and those that are tissue specific. We think of these as implying a, a driver. So for example, a cis trait, as I indicated, is if, if the expression of gene A located on chromosome one maps to that locus on chromosome one, we call that a cis trait. Whereas if there's a gene B located on chromosome 10, and these are the messenger RNA molecules that we measure with the array, if they map to chromosome one, we call that a trans trait. And then when we see this kind of behavior of lots and lots of genes mapping to a locus, we think of this as a master regulator. So you can imagine a, transcri a transcription factor, for example, at the end of chromosome six that targets the expression of all of these genes. Well, their messenger RNA molecules would map to that which is controlling it. And we think of where we model the system in that manner. One of the early things we did when we had our profiling is we asked, well, can we integrate our data with the human GYs? And there's about 130 genes that have been identified in human GYs studies that have an association for type 2 diabetes in human uh, studies. And we asked, well, are they expressed in the islet? I mean, if, if they're playing a role in the islet, they ought to be expressed there. And I'm showing you here that the vast majority of these genes, in fact, are expressed in the islet. And there's a lot of attention now in the human genetic studies to indicate that the genes associated with type 2 diabetes are likely playing a role in the islet directly, either affecting the health or the function of the islet. And I, I show you these, these are the GWAS genes here. The, these don't appear to be expressed. They could still be playing a role in diabetes, but maybe in other tissues. And we asked, well, if they're expressed in the islet and if they're playing a role, 
to explain diabetes susceptibility in our cross, will they show genetic linkage? And the answer is yes, they do. So here I'm looking uh, at a measure of the number of EQTL that map to a locus. The top panel shows that for male mice. The bottom panel shows that for female. And the tissues are color-coded. And if you look here on chromosome two, there's this big black uh, skyscraper, which are a lot of the GWAS genes mapping to chromosome two in the male islets. So not only does this show tissue specificity, it shows sex specificity. And we actually see that a great deal in the mice, is sexual dimorphism in their behavior. Well, the females also have a large skyscraper, but it's green, and that's a liver. So, so there are EQTL hotspots for these GWAS genes, some of which play a role in the islet, and some might be playing a role in the liver. And can we actually validate that as playing a role in the function? This shows actually a heat map of those genes. So on the left are the female GWAS EQTLs. On the right are the males. And you can see many more genes mapping to the chromosome 2 locus in the males than the females. Some of them are cis. So this little black circle indicates the genomic location of that gene. And when that coincides with the red stripe, that indicates that that is mapping to itself. So we would consider these two genes cis and the, these other genes trans. And in fact, probably all of the genes, with the exception of GRB14, we would consider trans in the male islet. Now again, based on that previous model that I showed you, that implies that there's some regulator sitting here, some transcription factor, or something that is affecting the expression of these genes to mediate their trans linkage to this locus. Because remember, these genes are spread throughout the genome, but their messenger RNA abundance is showing a genetic dependence to this locus. And we infer that to be some sort of regulator. Some of the genes go up and some of the genes go down as a function of genotype. So if you look over here, you can see that these genes are actually showing an increase as a function of genetics. So in the F2, at every single position in the genome, there's only three genotype possibilities. It's homozygote B6, it's a heterozygote, or it's homozygote BTBR. And we can ask, as a function of those three genotypes, what is the level of expression of every gene? And you can see that these genes are going up. So blue is a decrease, white is intermediate, and red is an increase. Whereas these genes are going down in their expression with each copy of BTBR allele. And a similar pattern is shown over here for the females. So what I'm trying to set you up for is that th we believe these genes are playing a critical role. We have genetic dependence for their expression being modulated on this locus on chromosome two. Can we identify a driver? What, one more piece of evidence to indicate that actually it's having a functional consequence on the behavior of the islets is we made a, a congenic mouse strain. So here's chromosome two, and we took a little chunk of BTBR and inserted it into an otherwise B6 animal, okay? So in everywhere else in the genome, it's B6 except for this region on chromosome two. And the region that we chose to insert is that region that these GWAS EQTLs are present. And so the argument is, if they're playing a role and we insert that BTBR sequence into an animal, does it give rise to a change in its behavior? And shown down here are what are called glucose tolerance tests. So you give the animal an oral glucose bolus, and then you measure plasma glucose as a function of time. And as it goes up and down, that's a, a function of glucose clearance, which is mediated by the release of insulin from the pancreas. So you can see over here in the females, whether they're B6 or the BTPR insert, there is no difference. And remind, let me remind you that in the females, there were many fewer of those GWAS EQTLs. 
to the islets. But over here in the male, when we put them on a high fat diet, you can see that the animals that have the insert have what we consider improved glucose tolerance. They do better. And they do better because they secrete more insulin. And we could reasonably say that this difference in behavior observed in the males for improved glucose tolerance is due to something that is on this insert because that's the only difference between these two animals. So this is, shows a different view, sort of um, the landscape architecture of the EQTL on chromosome two. Um, this was that large peak in the liver which is predominantly a female phenomenon. Uh, and then the black shows the, the EQTL for the islet. And NFATC2, um, for reasons that I'm going to show you that came from the causal inference modeling that Brian and Elias did, turns out to be our top candidate that is playing a role. It's a transcription factor. It's physically located at this locus. And what we want to do is ask, well, if it's really playing a role for mediating the linkage of these traits, how can we experimentally validate that? We calculated modules, as I showed you, and, and here we have the signed modules. So this is the, the scruffy feature that Peter talked about yesterday. Um, and we have a green module right here that actually contains NFATC2. And when we take the module eigengenes, and I've, I've smoked out the other ones except for the green. The module, the ME green, and we learned from Steve yesterday that module eigengene green maps to chromosome two. So now we have a handle on this thing from a module standpoint, okay? And I'm gonna come back to this later in the talk if we have time to talk about some of the other aspects of, of this architectural analysis. Brian, this is your old picture here. <laughs> yes. I saw you on the transcription experiment. In which you said that you are starting the EQTR, EQTL was done with the six background. And you improving the glucose tolerance test using the males? So the question is, you, you got it right. The question is, is the BTBR insert shown here into a B6 animal improving glucose tolerance? And the answer is yes. But at the beginning you said that the BTBR mouse are the one which become diabetic. That's true. But I also, I, yes, but I, I snuck in a, um, a qualifier there at the very end. I said there are likely anti-diabetic alleles in the BTBR, but not sufficient to overcome the pro-diabetic alleles. Because some of the F2 mice are so protected, they're more protected than B6 mice because they inherit some of those good alleles from the BTBR. And we think this locus actually contains an anti-diabetic allele, even though it derived from a pro-diabetic animal. Okay, because this is only 20 megabases of an otherwise three billion base pair genome. And certainly there are other loci and probably other tissues that are uh, promoting diabetes in the animal, but this guy looks like it's actually improving their function. Okay, so we have an expert in the audience, <laughs> and that's good. Um, he's, the question is, PPAR gamma it is actually increasing, okay? So blue becomes white, becomes red. The, the expression of this gene is increasing in the islet with each copy of the BTBR. It's additive, okay? If you get one copy, it's a little bit more than no copies. If you get two copies of BTBR, it's double the dose. And the question is, what, what, what is that doing? 
Is that consistent with the action of PPAR gamma elsewhere? And I don't know, but I think a lot of the literature looking at PPAR gamma is in the muscle and adipose tissue, and the function of this transcription factor in adipose and muscle might not be the same as its function in the islet. We had a question, this gentleman. How uh, old were the mice in the division setting of the context? Uh, they were 10 weeks of age. We wanted to fix that because the F2s were 10 weeks when we profiled them, and that's when we see the EQTL behavior, and so we wanted to do that same age dependence there. So they were high-fat diet challenged. They began at weaning. Sorry, the question was the age of the F2, the age of the congenic for this study. And is it possible that they're just early diabetics? Because you've removed a bunch of the other complex uh, traits? That's a very interesting question. So the, the, the question is, have we altered the temporal dependence of, of, of the diabetes by focusing on this allele for chromosome 2? Um, I, I'm not sure that we would be able to answer that because we didn't do the F2 study at multiple time points. We only did that at 10 weeks of age. Because a lot of the evidence suggests that it's a right? The question is, a lot of the evidence in the diabetes literature is that it's a multi-hit model, and you're absolutely right. So um, I'm focusing on the islets and their um, replication capacity is one of the areas that is of very interest to us, as well as their ability to secrete insulin. Uh, if they have a defect in one or both of those, that's two hit. If they're insulin resistant in the muscle, that's another hit. If they, if they don't, if they inappropriately make glucose in the liver, that's a, another hit. Uh, this gentleman talked about adipose, if, if there's adipokine secretion inappropriately. So it's absolutely right that, that diabetes is a multimodal uh, disease involving multiple tissues, which is why I put up that weighted network at the beginning. Okay, so let me... Let me talk about NFATC2. Um, Brian and Elias are going to cover this, um, the, the, the rigors of causal modeling. And so I'll, I'll be able to basically advertise uh, their talk tomorrow. But basically what they can do is use a pairwise computation to favor whether the relationship is a causal or reactive or independent. And by causal, I mean the QTL affects the gene of interest, which then affects a secondary gene. And this is the most interesting model because it's, it's testable. If, if G affects C, then one would expect if you overexpress G or knock down G, C ought to change. If, if it's reactive, then if this is really a one-way arrow, then if we modulate a G, you might not expect to see a change in C. So when Brian comes back with a, a causal relationship with a p-value of 10 to the minus 6 or whatever it was for NFATC2, we get very excited because we can test that. In addition to the causal inference that Brian and Elias did, we worked with um, Nitin Baliga and Chris Plazier at the ISB in Seattle. And completely independent of Brian and Elias's calculations, they did a motif analysis. They asked, well, if, if we believe that the genes that map to a locus do so by virtue of a transcription factor, can we look in their promoter and do a promoter analysis for known motifs? And this is a, Chris's representation of the mouse genome one through X, and all of these lines here are meant to indicate the genes that map to this locus right here. And, and their color is interesting because if it's, if it's green, it has a promoter for NFAT. If it's blue, Brian said it was causal. If it's red, it's both. Okay, so there was a convergence between the causal inference from the pairwise causality test and the motif search, and this is the signature in the first 10 KB of the promoter that Chris looked at for these co-mapping genes. And Chris indicated that this motif was present in this many genes. Brian indicated that this many genes followed that Q to G to C causal relationship that I showed you in the previous. And this was the overlap. And 
statistics and permutation tells us that that's remarkable. So we set out to test it. And we first had to learn what it was. So NFAT is a transcription factor that can be activated. It's this little butterfly here. And when it's phosphorylated, it's inactive and remains in the cytosol. Upon calcium entry, there's an enzyme called calcineurin, which is a phosphatase, that gets turned on and it clips these little phosphate residues from the butterfly, which migrates to the nucleus. And when it's in the nucleus, it complexes with two other factors, CFOS and CJUN, and finds their cognate motifs in the promoter of their target genes and turns them on. Okay? This shows a sequence alignment of the NFAT family in mouse. And what I want to highlight is that there's a region here that is highly conserved among the family. This is the DNA binding domain. There's also the N terminus and the C terminus that are apples and oranges among the family. So that's very important because of those, the C June and C FOS that I showed you a moment ago are likely going to show specificity for their binding partners by virtue of this variability in these regions. These little dots here indicate the serine residues that were phosphorylated and are the target of calcineurin. Okay, and so we had to first um, find a way to study this molecule and we chose a constitutively active mutant of it where each one of these serines, and there's there's 14 of them, were mutated to alanine. Okay, so they're constitutively active mutant, not requiring calcineurin to dephosphorylate. It's full blast on. We express it in the islet, and if it's going to play a role, it should do so independent of that previous butterfly cartoon that I showed a moment ago. This shows a uh, a time course for the effect of NFAT C2 overexpression um, in mouse islets. And I should say that it's, it's a real pain to work in the islet because it's completely bulletproof for any transfection reagent that anybody will sell you. And believe me, we've tried them all. So we have to make an adenovirus or, or a lentivirus to overexpress any gene. And that means it's 3,000 bucks to make a virus. And so you better guess right. If you can just use lipofectamine, you can go get the plasmid for 100 bucks and try it, but you can't do that in an island. So we were very pleased to see that when we overexpress constitutively active NFAT C2, shown by the red bars, and if you can just focus on the 48 hours here, essentially every red bar is higher than the gray bar for uh, these conditions that we tested. So we're looking at low glucose, intermediate glucose, high glucose, and you can see that it's higher here, it's much higher here. Th this is a, a way to probe various um, pathways within the, within the islet that govern insulin secretion. So if you add potassium, that's a non-metabolic signal that depolarizes the membrane and affects the calcium entry. And you can see that's promoted. Um, this is a membrane permeant analog of cyclic AMP. And, and GLP1, that's that hormone that I talked about at the beginning that comes out of the gut and promotes insulin secretion. And so you can see that essentially every secretagogue was promoted in response to constitutively act active NFAT C2. And that, that's hard to do. This system operates at near perfection. And so if you can overexpress one gene and get it to operate better, that's a big deal. It's really easy to negatively affect insulin secretion. You can do all kinds of things to make it work more poor, but it's difficult to actually make it work better. Uh, this is a, a separate study that was done um, in parallel with NFAT-C1. And actually, this is confounding us, and I'll show you why in a moment ago, because Essentially, these two things are doing exactly the same thing. And NFAT C1 is located on chromosome 18. 
and we arrived at NFATC2 because it was located on chromosome 2. But both genes are positively affecting insulin secretion. And in fact, I'm highlighting only that secretagogue which was not affected, arginine. And we don't understand that. We think it's interesting. Um, but uh, basically, NFATC1 and NFATC2 can augment insulin secretion when you overexpress it in the islet. Uh, we're members of the IEDP, which is the Integrated Islet Distribution Program for Human Islets, and we routinely study them because um, we have to and we want to. We want to ask if our studies in mouse translate to human biology. And I'm showing you here a failure because it, when we overexpress NFATC1 and NFATC2 in the mouse islets, I showed you a second ago that they worked beautifully, but in the human islets, uh, they didn't do anything. And you might say, well, then you're not studying something relevant to humans. And I would say that that's highly unlikely, that there's probably another reason that um, NFATC2 and NFATC1 failed to promote insulin secretion in humans, and the, the failure to do so is probably going to be really interesting to figure out why. And, and I believe that it's biologically relevant, because when I do a sequence alignment, uh, across species, uh, they're identical. So not only is NFATC2 present in the human islet, it's identical to the sequence in mouse. And so its failure to affect secretion is telling us something about insulin secretion regulation. This man has a question, I saw it. <laughs> Okay, so the, the question is, um, what was the level of overexpression of the NFATC1 and NFATC2 in the mouse versus the human islets, and could that explain why it might not have been effective in human? Yes, what's, what's the endogenous level of expression? So uh, admittedly, when you use an adenovirus that is being driven by a CMV promoter, and I don't I'm going to assume there's somebody in the audience that doesn't know what CMV promoter is. So it's cytomegalovirus, and it's a very strong promoter. Okay, and um, when we use an adenovirus with the CMV promoter, we are driving the expression hugely, probably orders of magnitude above that which would be present endogenously. Okay, um, and that's just uh, it's an artifact of using viruses. It's unavoidable in our case. So. We are way above what endogenous levels of expression would be, but I'm going to show you a moment that we think endogenous activity is actually present and quite high w without our virus, okay? So um, I don't know the precise answer to how much expression we achieved, but I can tell you it's way above endogenous levels. One of the things that we always do is we ask, it's, it's genetic polymorphism that is conferring diabetes susceptibility in our mouse. And so when we land on a gene that we think is playing a key, a key role, we immediately ask, is there a SNP, a single nucleotide polymorphism? And this is actually a, a region of NFATC2 for which we've identified two SNPs in BTBR. There's a proline here at 251 that, that is a proline in every single species that I can get off the database, in, including the, the dinosaur fish, coelacanth. But this proline is a leucine in BTBR mouse. <laughs> okay, and the degree of conservation um, suggests that it's somehow important. Whereas there's another leucine that becomes a proline over here that is not nearly as conserved. Okay, now a proline, a, a proline is an is a odd amino acid. It forms a kink in the amino acid structure. And so a proline becoming a leucine is a dramatic change in the overall structure of the protein. We don't know if that actually affects the function. We're asking that question right now. But the degree of conservation suggests that it might. 
and that's very interesting to us. And I indicate here the, the proline and the, these are the two SNPs, they're, they're actually sandwiched between all of those phosphoserines. Okay? So we have ongoing studies to actually compare the constitutively active mutant for NFATC2 that I showed you was effective to drive insulin secretion in the mouse. That, that was a B6 version of NFATC2. We're inserting the proline to leucine mutation in that construct to ask if that disrupts the ability of that gene to promote insulin secretion. And that'll be exciting to, cause, exciting to us if we get that result. And I wish I had it now, but it's, they're doing it as I speak. There's a crystal structure, actually, of, of human NFATC1. So here's the DNA molecule. There's NFATC1, there are the, the C-terminal domain shown in red the N-terminal domain shown right here, and it's truncated, unfortunately. So it was a 399, and the SNPs that I showed you a moment ago were in 250. So I would love to be able to point to the crystal structure and say, see, that proline is critical, but it's invisible to us. Uh, and so we're actually considering some crystallization studies of our own to ask if that SNP affects uh, the crystal structure, as well as its ability to bind the C June and C FOS as the binding partners to function as a transcription factor. Finally, I want to touch on uh, related to the question a moment ago about well, what's the endogenous NFAT signaling activity look like? And I want to go over here to this cartoon and indicate that remember it was calcineurin activated by calmodulin in response to calcium that that dephosphorylated the butterfly, allowed it to go in, and, and there's a very good inhibitor of calcineurin called FK506. And in fact, people that used to take that drug for tissue rejection uh, had um, side effects of hyperinsulinism and hypoglycemia. And so they discontinued that use, but FK506 is an inhibitor of calcineurin and we asked, well, what does it do to the islet? And it turns out, if you just focus on this panel right here, when we add FK506 at 10 or 20 micromolar, these colored bars are lower than this dark bar. And so that suggests to us that endogenous signaling is actually quite high. Um, and there's some calcineurin-dependent activation of NFAT probably going on endogenously, and we're trying to study the effect of a constitutive mutant on top of that, and that's confounding our results. And it turns out that NFATC1 is located on chromosome 18, but in fact, it maps in trans right on top of where NFATC2 is located. But this is a trouble for us, because if we want to test Brian's prediction that NFATC2 is mediating the transcriptional regulation of those target genes on chromosome two, we might have NFATC1 in there playing a role as well. And so over here, it's possible that when we overexpress NFATC2, it can directly affect insulin secretion, or its effects could be mediated through the activation of NFATC1. And so experiments that we're doing right now are to use calcineurin to abolish endogenous signaling, and then on top of that suppressive condition, ask what is the effect of the constitutive mutants. And the fact that NFATC1 maps in trans to the NFATC2 locus tells us that we might get a different answer. So I'm, I'm gonna end this section, and if I have time, Steve, if you let me, I'll continue on the cell cycle story. But these are the questions that um, are burning in the wet lab right now. So I told you that FK506 was a tool that we can use to get rid of this confounding effect of endogenous signaling and study the constitutive mutants on top of that. Um, I think the failure of the NFATs to affect humans is really interesting. And it might be that they have sky high endogenous activity and we'd be super responsive to the FK molecule, and so we're doing those studies right now. We're going to study this, um, this SNP in terms of whether it affects function of the NFAT. 
Um, and I indicated that there's are C-June and C-FOS and probably unidentified cofactors that are necessary once it gets into the nucleus. And the real home run for us in terms of validating the prediction would be that when we can overexpress NFAT, it promotes insulin secretion. Does it affect transcriptionally the genes that Brian and Elias indicated were causally downstream? That would, that would be exciting to us because that would tell us that we can use that causal inference to interrogate our loci, predict drivers, and then test them. And that's, um, that's a major goal of the lab. Okay, so if I have time, I'm gonna spend just four more slides. Um, Steve's he, modules, modules, modules. They're really exciting, we use them all the time. And he said, well, tell them, tell them about that. And so, I'm, I'm again, I'm going back to the sign modules, and we've calculated those in every tissue. Um, they're fantastic. Th this is that cell, a cell cycle module has been of particular interest to us. Remember, it was the green right here, this little scruffy guy contained NFAT C2. Well, this royal blue module, and it's, it's really interesting if you can get a lot of modules because you see colors that you've never heard of, like periwinkle. I, I don't know what periwinkle is, but you get really interesting names. But royal blue in the islet is this guy filled with those cell cycle genes that I showed you stratified the mice. There's also a cell cycle uh, module in adipose. And in fact, what's really interesting is that the transcripts in the adipose module are nearly the same as the transcripts in the islet module. And so you'd say, well, it's okay. I mean, adipose has got to grow, islets have got to grow. It's the same transcripts, right? Well, in fact, it is. But one thing we can do is we can map it, right? So we've got eigengenes. And we use the eigengenes to map. Because remember, we did this in the context of a genetic screen. So here we have all the MEs, and you're not meant to read them. Um, but these are the module eigengenes. These are the chromosomes. And the little red blips indicate where the eigengenes map. And if I do this, now, here's the cell cycle module in adipose. And it maps to chromosome 1, but most strongly to chromosome 10. Whereas the cell cycle module in islet, you can kind of go across here, you see a little green there on 7, but boom, it maps to 17. Yep, there's a question way in the back. Um, the, the way that we map an eigengene is very similar to how we map a transcript. So for an individual transcript of a gene, we have a, a quantitative measure of that gene in every single animal. And messenger RNA abundance, we can think of as like body weight. You do a t-test at every single locus across the genome. Now imagine doing that same thing for an eigengene, but treat the eigengene as a metatrait. That is a, a, a weighted average of all of the transcripts in that module. It's not a real gene. It's a, it's a representation of all of the genes in the module of interest. And we calculated modules in all transcripts. We didn't do any bias. It was like 35,000 probes. And, and now we've got it down to 20 eigengenes, one of which is this cell cycle module that represents 223 transcripts. If I were to map the 223 transcripts, in fact, I'm going to show you a heat map coming up, but if you map the individual transcripts, you essentially get the same kind of profile that you do if you map the eigengene. So, so this is really interesting, and I, it, it indicates that the genetic architecture, or let's say it more simply, that the, that the loci that control replication in these two tissue types is distinct. Now, and some might say, well, that's, that's not surprising, adipose, islet, they're different tissues. But again, what we want to do is identify the driver. What is the driver in islet that is mediating this behavior? And what's the driver over here that is mediating the behavior in adipose? And we can do that with causal inference and motif analysis. And we can do that using the eigengene rather than the individual transcripts. So this is the last slide. 
And I think it might address the earlier question is, what is an eigengene and, and why do that over the individual messenger RNA transcripts? Uh, it's, the simple answer is easier. It's, it's one trait versus thousands. But I'm looking at a heat map now, chromosome 17 here. And these are EQTLs in the islet. Chromosome 10 over here, EQTL in adipose. And so I think you can see this is a hot spot. These are the cell cycle transcripts in those modules. And you can see that they all map pretty nicely in line. And at the top of each panel, I have a clinical trait. So in the adipose, it was adipose weight that co-mapped with the EQTLs for cell cycle, whereas in the audit, it was a measure of beta cell proliferation. And, and that's an independent validation that the EQTL for a gene actually means something, because we're, here we have a clinical trait showing the same genetic dependence as our EQTL architecture. And so we're, I can't tell you uh, how much time we've spent on 25 megabases on chromosome 17, but it's been uh, years. To identify what is the driver sitting here mediating the linkage of these traits. And of course, there are cysts here. We've already looked at them and ruled them out. So something else is there. So I'm going to end here. It's, it's, I've had the privilege to show data that um, a, a huge team of people has been involved in generating. So there's, there's the wet lab, there's the, uh, the Addy lab, and I actually should be an edge in a network between the wet lab and the statistics lab because I, I bridge a lot of the wet work that goes on here with the statistics team and their incredible students that keep us honest. And um, right now I'm, I'm, I'm bridging back to the biology lab and saying, okay, NFATC2 is the cat's meow, let's figure it out and, um, and val validate it. We, we have a number of collaborators, um, many of which um, started at Merck, then it became Rosetta, and now it's Mount Sinai, uh, led by Eric Schatt uh, and a number of his colleagues, uh, and we're, we're generously supported by a number of institutions. Thank you. I always worry when there's no questions. Did, did, did they understand everything or nothing? <laughs> yeah. So have you checked to see which drugs affect NFAT C2 and then uh, assess whether they have any anti-diabetic properties? So the, the question is whether we have um, tested any drugs that affect NFAT C2 and whether they have any anti-diabetic properties. So as I indicated, um, FK506 and other drugs like it have been used in the past for tissue rejection. And in fact, they do have a side effect of hypoglycemia. It, that would be consistent, right, with what I was showing you. And um, as far as I know, there are no drugs that directly affect the transactivation activity of NFATC2. So um, we don't have any, and I'm, and I'm not aware of anything other than the calcium neurin targets that I talked about. And we haven't tested any in our, in our animal yet ourselves. Peter. Would you be able to narrow the, the search space for, for the regulators that could cause this? So you see a cell cycle, a cell cycle module, uh, it would lead, at least lead straight to a hypothesis that uh, something goes wrong with the cell cycle in the islet, and that's why the islet died, because the cell cycle doesn't progress. And then you said in the beginning that Well, the, the, the search has to begin with the gene that is located at that locus. And um, because we did our study in an F2 intercross, the, the genomic resolution is 
that. It's 20 to 30 megabases. And when you land on a gene-rich region like we have there, there's about 350 genes physically located at that locus. So that's our, that's our search space right now, is 350 genes. And it need not be one, actually, that has, a, has an EQTL. I was describing to Steve yesterday that it can simply be a gene that has a SNP that affects function, but not an expression QTL. So we actually have to consider every single gene sitting there. And you know, there's link RNAs now. It could be a non-coding RNA playing a role. So our search base, I think, has been dramatically reduced because you're right. The, the animal that fails to increase beta cell replication in response to obesity is in trouble. That's BTBR. In that 2008 paper, we actually identified that cell cycle module, and it was very important because the failure of obesity to upregulate that module was present at four weeks of age, the pre-diabetic animal. So you could argue that the, the defect actually was causal, not related to the reaction of disease state. So now we've gone on and tracked that same cell cycle module in these F2s, and that's where it maps. So we've gone from 30,000 genes to 300, and that's our search space now. Is, is there's a, there, we believe it's the same genes in this module that were in that genomic study, and now we have the loci to which it maps. So I, I believe the question is, have we compared the module um, enriched for cell cycle in islet to a cell cycle module in other tissues? My question was, uh, it's from the mouse data. Have you compared this group of genes? What is the status in human? We have human adipose. Yes. So We, we published a paper um, a few years ago showing that uh, another transcription factor, FOXM1, was in the cell, the, the, the question, sorry, the question is have we compared our mouse data to human data for genes involved in cell cycle regulation? And the answer is yes. Um, in a paper that we published showing that FOXM1, a, a critical gene in our module, not physically located here but not a driver at this locus, um, is capable of inducing proliferation in mouse and human islets, and the expression of genes that it targets um, in the mouse and the human islets are very similar, and the expression of those genes correlate with BMI in humans, as it does in the mouse. So we believe that a collection of the transcripts that are listed here in this module, in fact, do have cross-validation in human disease state, but that doesn't inform us about what the driver is yet, because none of those genes are at this locus. Yes. 